Next up we have Gerald Coley. He is a 30-year veteran of the electronics industry. He's the co-founder of BeagleBoard, which supports the low-cost open hardware ARM Cortex processor. He has worked with companies and universities supporting them in hardware architecture, design, training, and manufacturing. He's worked with Texas Instruments, uh, OMAP, and Citara processors from their early days and has designed over 20 development boards. So without further ado, Gerald Scully. <laughs> Thank you very much. I had intended to come out here and compliment the people that have organized this thing. I will not do that. I don't know how, how you follow that. It just happened. I just, you know, I, I, I just don't know. I've got to ask this question though. How many people in the audience consider yourself hardware people? I got goosebumps. I've been doing these talks for a number of years now and they're mainly to software people. And I will tell you this right now. I think of all those talks I've done, I think I remember three women in the audience. So, if you want to go where the women are, you go to hardware. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, <laughs> and by the way, women, that means we need more of you because there's obviously not enough to go around. Um, I'm the co-founder of BeagleBoard.org along with uh, Jason Kreidner. Uh, one of us has been called the butt of BeagleBoard.org, the other one the, the face. I'm not going to tell you which one's which, but Jason's back there somewhere. Jason, can you stand up and wave? Now, Jason is kind of like what I like to call a pervert. Uh, <laughs> He knows enough about hardware to be dangerous, but he's really a software person, okay? I love the software people that don't, any, don't know anything about hardware, so Jason's the, the perfect match. Um, I'm going to try to keep this presentation short. I cut it back. I've only got 936 slides. <laughs> so we'll go by death by PowerPoint here. Um, I've got a lot to say. I'm not exactly sure what order I'll say it in, so I guess I'll just follow this. The embedded world needs engines. When I say engines, that's a piece of hardware that does a function. I've yet to see a processor that you can solder on a board and do anything with it. Okay, it has to perform some sort of a function. <coughs> Building these engines take time. I can remember when I started in my career, we would, it would take two, two and a half, three years to develop a product and uh, the first nine months was getting the software going, the next nine months was getting the OOS to say hello world. Okay, and it takes a long time to get these things going and that is something that to me stifles innovation because when someone wants to build something they've already got something in mind at the end that they want to get to it's all this other stuff that gets in the way like a software person wants to write code on day one okay but if you're going to have to develop your hardware from scratch that's going to be a problem for you one engine is not enough today we have a big engine that's uh, somewhat has uh, dominated the market uh, over the last several decades and that's the PC. You know, there's only one, okay? And I like the movie The Highlander and all that, but there can't be only one. There's gotta be a better way of doing things. Different tasks need different engines, okay? Just because it's kinda like, uh, you know, when the only thing you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail, okay? Sometimes you need a screwdriver, pliers, pliers other items, so you've got to have a different engine for a different task. You just can't keep using the same thing over and over again. So my concept is that the best engine will have certain features, okay? The right features for you. They might not be the right features for the other person or based on the application, it could be something different, but you're looking for a certain set of features that you need to do whatever it is that you're trying to do. Whatever type of device, product, you know, something that you want to turn on the, the lights in your house or control the sprinkler system or, you know, when the kids start screaming it automatically turns up the stereo. It's going to have the right software. Not necessarily all the software, 
but the software that you can do your stuff on top of, okay? In other words, it needs an OS, it needs the basic uh, drivers, interfaces. So if you find that right engine, that's what it's going to have. And it needs to have the best available hardware documentation. I don't know how many times I've tried to help software people turn on a GPIO bit. Okay, how do you make that bit go high? Well, first, sometimes you have to tell them what high is, and they understand it doesn't have anything to do with drugs. It's just a little scope going up in, you know, up one level on the uh, scope. It needs to have broad support. One of the things that people are afraid of is risk, and having something out there that has a broad level of support, a lot of people out there, they're not alone. They've got some people that they can feel like they can go to and, and get help if they need it. And it needs to have a large following. That's what's happened to us on BeagleBoard. And I'll explain a little bit later on as to you know, why we did it. Uh, I think the answer might surprise you. But uh, you know, when you go out there and you see it all over the place, people are blogging about it, both good and bad, okay? That is a good thing. So if you put your hardware out there, don't be afraid that people are going to criticize it. At least they're talking about you. I believe that open hardware can be a source of these engines. Okay, instead of trying to shoehorn that one engine in, we've got a bunch of different options. So what I want to talk about is taking this from a developer's perspective. And for this discussion, I've created in my own mind three different classes of developers. I'm sure there's more. You may not agree. You may disagree. But I needed a way to kind of explain my concepts and what I'm thinking about and what I've experienced over the, the last several years. So I'll start with the originator. The originator is someone that actually makes this thing. They create it, they publish it, they get it working, they build it, they put the money into it, and then make it available for everyone to use. There's also what I call the consumer. Okay? The consumer is someone that leverages that hardware. In other words, the idea is that we get people to use it. And when I say leverage the hardware, what I actually mean is someone that actually takes that design and puts it into their own design. Okay? In other words, they're making a platform based on this engine and they're going to use it in their product or it could be hopefully another open hardware platform. And I want to talk about viewing it as a contributor. Someone that actually improves the open hardware design and publishes it and puts it back out in the community. This is the one area that I have some concerns about that I think we need to address and try to figure out how to make this happen because there are some you know, aspects of hardware that are a little bit different than so software. I used to have the term recode, restart. You know, you change one line, you recompile it, you put it and go. Okay, relaying out a PC board, you know, for those of you in the hardware business, that is not an easy task to do, especially when nobody wants to pay for it. So, let's talk about the originator. I've broken the originator down into three subcategories as well. The good old chip provider, you know, so we got to have that, that sand to, to, to use. The platform provider, and what I'm calling the platform, is that, that board, that device that is based, it is open hardware that people can use. And then we'll talk about the software provider. Yes, software people do get into the hardware business. I can remember early in my career, I actually used to design products that had no software in them at all, and they actually made decisions and ran. So, no, they weren't vacuum tubes either. Okay, the good old chip provider. Um, I work for Texas Instruments, and we're obviously a chip provider, you've got to have chips. Now, when we started BeagleBoard.org, the concept was that the least qualified entity on the planet to tell anyone how to use a product is the chip provider. We would sit in meetings and, you know, what's this market segment, you know, what's the potential there, what's this, what's that. And we would design our development boards based upon what we thought, okay, which were mostly marketing types, that the world needs, okay? Well, we decided that that was not the best way to go about doing things, okay? So even to this day, open hardware is something that's new to TI, and Jason and I are constantly fighting a battle within a large company like TI to get people to understand open hardware. There's a lot of people doing it, but they really don't understand it. Okay, so we're still struggling to, to this day to get TI to really appreciate and understand what it is. But as a result of this open hardware, uh, at the end of every month I get an email, Gerald, how many Beagle boards did you guys ship? Okay, those are marketing numbers and they like that. But what I was looking for was 
the ability to get a bunch more development boards out there. And as a result of Beagle, we had development boards popping up all over the place. There's been dozens of them, and that's great, okay? It gives our customers a lot of options. So, in my mind, it has been a big success for TI, and there are other companies that are starting to get involved in it, and, uh, you know, we'll have to kind of see how they go about doing things. But from a TI perspective, it lowers the support cost, it is a chance to learn from the community, okay? To me, that's been the hard part, is to get people within a large company like TI to listen to the community, okay? Because after all, you know, we, we know it all, okay? You know, we're the chip provider, so you can't do it without us. So we still fight that battle on a, on a daily basis. But it also improves the, the uh, software offerings because there's a lot more options for our customer. You know, obviously, TI is not in position to support every OS. So they support, basically, we support one flavor of Linux, and then all the other OSs come down on top of the Beagle board, okay? And that's what our customers need. Yeah, it's a great marketing tool and all that. However, I have to ask the question, is our chip providers required to do open hardware for it to be success, a success? How much do we need the chip providers to provide us with information and tools to use their products? And on top of that, if engaged, will chip providers contribute to the success of open hardware? You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, good side, bad side, good cop, bad cop. We want them to contribute, we want them to be there, but we don't want them taking over and trying to tell us what to do. And that's a battle that Jason and I fight pretty much on a daily basis to, to keep TI, you know, as much out of BeagleBoard as we can because the concept we had behind BeagleBoard was to get TI out of the way give our products to people, let them innovate, let them do whatever it is they want to do. And uh, we are continually surprised by the things that people do, but that's what it's about, providing the ability to innovate and just get out of the way. So there, the, the next originator is a platform provider. This is the true, these are the true open heart, hardware gurus. These are the people that put it out for all the right reasons. They're forever known as the original chef, so no matter how many derivatives, der, derivatives are made from that, they're always the one that started it, okay? So there's a certain uh, you know, amount of uh, notoriety, but then there's also a certain level of responsibility as well. And so I'll admit, when I first got down the path of open hardware, I did all this work and I'm giving it away, okay? You know, it's kind of like uh, companies that have uh, uh, all these NDAs around their chips. Well, the idea is that just people are gonna buy them and use them, right? Yeah, but they might copy it. Okay, well, if you don't want, then don't, don't sell it. You know, put it in a vault and hire a guard and you'll have it safe. <laughs> Typically, in my opinion, a platform is targeted to a particular audience, okay, with a certain set of features. It goes back to what I said earlier about the engine. You need an engine for a specific application. They promote their architecture. This is the way they did it. There's more than one way to build a board but they've tapped into what they feel is the right mix of features and the right way to do things, where to put the right peripherals, what's the right peripherals, and they're trying to promote that architecture to get everybody behind it. It also encourages people to uh, do add-on boards, add functionality. You know, one of the things that I've had to ask a lot about on the Beagle board, why don't you put Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and all this kind of stuff on it? Because if we did that, that would be the Wi-Fi and that would be the Bluetooth, okay? We want to be able to support all Bluetooth, all Wi-Fi, okay? We want the competition, we want people to be able to innovate and we're not trying to do anything that caps uh, what we have. Uh, it allowed them to grow their audience, increase their sales of boards, you know, hey, you know, if you want the, the best, you know, go back to the original. It also increases software availability. So as you need software to make this hardware run, more that people adopt the platform, create software, the better off for you. Uh, the software provider can also be uh, a, an originator. Their main product may be tools and software, but there's this battle of, well, it doesn't run on my PC, doesn't run on the Mac, doesn't run on Linux. If it runs on a PC, you would literally have to buy 50,000 PCs and run it on every day to make sure it still worked, okay? It's just, it's just a nightmare. So if they've got it running on a piece of hardware, then they can say, hey, it always works here. This is the one that we want to promote. Shows our value of the, of the software. And it's not a case of having to figure out how the hardware works. It'll also lower the support cost. You don't have to go through and answer all these questions for all these wild different platforms that are out there. It's a lot faster than driving a standard. 
you know, over the years, there's been a lot of standards committees that are put together and put this standard, and we're always going to come to some agreement. Everyone in that room has a hidden agenda, and what they're looking for is an advantage, okay? So if you want to try to create a standard, oh, okay, we want to make the world have a standard, and it's got to use our software, and we're going to get rich. This is a much easier way to do it, okay? Your board's ready when you're ready. It's out there. It's available. You don't have to worry about anybody else. You can show off your software. Of course, you can also free to leverage available platforms, but maybe it's missing something. Maybe you feel like you need to have an, a certain feature. You can use that existing platform, modify it, add something to it that really shows off your software. Like your software, you know, runs a laser cannon and it draws graffiti in the walls that they can't erase, okay, then, you know, you got to make sure that that hardware has that feature on it. Obviously, there's the marketing aspect of things. It's a great marketing tool. Everybody knows this cool software that runs out there, and then hopefully someday somebody will come along and want you to put their, your software on their hardware, and you're off and running. The consumer, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is someone that actually leverages this hardware in their design. They're about risk reduction. As I mentioned earlier, back in the old days, after vacuum tubes, we would go out and have to create the OS. We had to create the, the, the processor, the OS, the uh, schedule of the messaging system, all that kind of stuff. It took a very long time to put this hardware together. And we made a lot of mistakes along the way because obviously it, ne it never really worked you know, on day one. But if you're leveraging open source hardware, then it reduces the risk. You, you know what this thing is. You know what it will do. It may do everything you want it to do, it may, but it may be missing a feature here and there, but at least you know what you've got. It also gives you the ability to focus on your value add as a consumer. Okay, now I've got all this base stuff going. It's in a small form factor. It's low power. I can add the features to it that I want to have added. Obviously, it's going to lower your development cost. Uh, time is money. And the more work you have to put in, the more money you're going to spend. It's going to take longer. And, uh, you know, at, at least this way the software folks know what it's going to be and they can't complain at the end when it doesn't match what they thought it should be that they forgot to tell you when you started. Um, there's a lot, le a lot of less issues using open hardware. You know, there are, there are issues, you know, as I mentioned, a shorter development time. Uh, but the software can start working immediately. You can start putting your software application on there so you can actually run parallel, parallel developments between the hardware and the software. Most importantly, it lets you focus on your IP. And when I say IP, that's what your product does, okay? Uh, you know, whether it's in a blood glucose, glucose meter or some medical device or something like that, you can focus on that instead of trying to figure out why the ethernet doesn't work or why you can't get that red LED to blink green when it's the wrong color anyway. There's a lots of resources to leverage. It's, it's kind of funny. Uh, there at TI, we have these forums where people come in and ask questions, and you know, we tell them to recompile their code, and they say, what's a compiler? And you know, you know right then there, you're, you're in trouble. But engineers typically don't like to ask questions. And when they do ask questions, they're already so desperate and aggravated that by the time they get to you, the first thing you gotta do is calm them down and try to figure out what they're trying to ask. You know, we need to promote an environment where people are free to ask. You know, it's okay to say, I don't know, okay? That's the only way that you're going to learn, okay? And to be honest with you, this was a hard lesson for me to learn over the years because, you know, if you act like you don't know what you're talking about, then, you know, you'll be doing something else. But I think that's something that we need to, you know, promote in the open hardware world. Is it's okay to ask. It's okay not to know. Everybody learns. Everybody gets better. And everybody benefits from it. There are some consumer caveats here, and this is something that I've experienced firsthand. There's different skill levels of consumers out there. And these are people that either want to build your board as is, they want to add something to it. There's a lot of them that are lost. Oh, I've got the open hardware information. Great, I got the, these G, 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 what do they call Gerber files, yeah. Okay, I get the boards made. Okay, so I send it out, I get my PCB, you know, back in a day and a half, and uh, you know, the parts just show up from some place, you know, and they don't understand some logistics. So just because it's open hardware, you know, doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to be successful. You've got to know what you're doing. 
one of my concerns in open hardware is we've got to make sure we've got a way to train the people, teach the people, help the people, and make sure they got the right expectations. We don't want people running around saying, oh, open hardware is a disaster because I couldn't, I couldn't build a board, okay? I don't know how many of you have etched PCBs in your bathtub or your sink or whatnot over the years, but I will challenge you to do a 12-layer board and, and etch it that way, okay? <laughs> and I, I don't think it's gonna work very well. And, you know, there's, there's a, it's a great start, starting point, it gets you going, but you've really got to know what you're doing. There's also varying levels of technology. Um, I've mentioned vacuum tubes several times. Uh, there is a new vacuum tube of the future. Uh, it's called through-hole components. They're getting harder and harder to find, okay? Uh, if they exist, you can't get them. How many of the audience here have ever put together a wire wrap board? I'm in heaven. <laughs> in my career started, we used to do the wire wrap boards, okay? And you take the little wire, you know, and you'd, you'd put the through hole parts in, you'd do little wires on it, and that's how we prototype, okay? We found a lot of mistakes, and when we did the PCB, it usually worked pretty well. You can't do wire wrap board today. You've actually got to go out and build it. So some of the newer technologies are, are getting tougher and tougher. The more complicated SOCs and 32-bit processors don't come in, in dip packages. And can you put it in a dip package? Okay, we got 512 pins. Okay, so if I'm making a dip package, let's see, a point one space, <laughs> be that long. So, th so if, if anybody wants to do that, that's fine. I'll give the name, we'll call it the weenie board. So some of these may be new to you, some may, may be something you're familiar with but you're not sure of. Uh, you're gonna need to make adjustments. We're finding a lot of PCB companies, assembly houses, are not willing to tackle some of this stuff. And they're slowly, you know, going away. They're afraid. They're afraid to say, I don't know. They're afraid to, to go out and learn. So when you do find one that you can work with, you're going to need to make adjustments. Everything that's been provided, they've done a good job on open hardware, tells you how to make it, okay? And gives you everything that was used to make it. But it doesn't mean when you put it over here into in this easy bake oven over here that it's actually going to work, okay? So you're going to have to make adjustments. And you need to have some understanding of how to make those adjustments. Um, assembly, ha assembly houses have their quirks. When I've worked with some real quirky ones, okay? Even the one I work with now is a little bit quirky, but, uh, you know, I, I can deal with that. Uh, PCB shops are a nightmare. Uh, we had a lot of problems in the early days of Beagle. We were having shorts and all this kind of stuff. We couldn't figure out what was going on and the CAD file looked good, the design looked good, and then we found out after much interrogation, oh yeah, we automatically open up the solder mask, you know, it makes it easier on us. Oh, yeah, you know what, you're right. We just measured it and it's terrible, okay? And so well, we, we can't make it any better than that. Well, we kept asking and demanding and, and finally they did. So these are things that you could go, could kind of get you off on a bad footing, a bad, you know, on the wrong track if you don't pick the right company. And be honest with you, it's very hard to figure out how to do that. If you don't have the experience, you need to find out, the, talk to the people that do. I think the open hardware needs to have the ability. Who makes my boards for me? Okay, who's my PCB shop? Okay, we're not trying to drive business in that direction, but at least you can talk to them, you can find out who they are, and if you're really desperate, you can actually go back and, and use those people. But, uh, you know, I don't want to see out there, yeah, I tried open hardware and I could never get the board to work, open hardware doesn't work. Uh, there are, I'm also concerned about the contributors. Will a consumer become a contributor? In other words, will it be improved? You know, you take a piece of software, you put it out there, it works great, I made some improvements, it runs faster, it takes less memory, you know, all this kind of stuff, and they've improved it and they put it back out there. It takes a lot of time and effort to improve the hardware and put it back out there. I have deep concerns of how much that's actually going to happen and I think that's something that we need to try to figure out how to do. If I put this thing into my, into my product, then it's improved, but I don't want to put my product out there. So, you know, to be honest, you know, if the hardware is defined as a complete functioning unit with all that, that's all well and good. We may need to do something a little bit different somewhere down the line and think about bits and pieces. How many in the audience remember Forrest Mims? 
Radio Shack used to put out his little notebook, all these little circuits. That's how I cut my teeth, okay? Putting those things together, okay? Uh, I don't know that you could put a 512 pin chip in there and all that kind of stuff and you know, draw it up on a graph paper on how to hook it up. But, you know, maybe you can. Um, so only if that product becomes open hardware is it going to actually contribute to the community. So what would motivate them to improve the original? Okay, what will motivate them to take it to the open hardware? Okay, I have some concerns about that. Okay, I, I really do. So I think it's something we need to address. So in my mind, the best contributor is another platform provider. I took this platform, I used open, open hardware documentation, I changed a, f a feature to, added something to it, and it goes back out into the community. Uh, another software provider, another originator, you know, doing, doing their own thing, leveraging a, a portion of that, okay? So to really make open hardware be there, we've got to keep open hardware originators because for some of us old guys that are doing it, uh, we do plan to retire someday, okay? So we need some other people to step up and, and, and keep the ball rolling. The open hardware dream, it creates the competition to provide the best. We've lacked competition in the PC industry for a long time. Uh, you know, the original IBM PC, for those that uh, bought one when they had the, uh, you know, what was it? You'll never need more than uh, 64K bytes of memory or 10 gig drive. Thanks, Bill, you hit that one right on the head. Uh, we need the ability to compete, okay? That's the way we're gonna get the best engines. Open hardware gives us a choice of engines. Um, I was at a conference several years ago and this gentleman came up and said, uh, looking at our product, I said, what do you do? Well, I make uh, infusion pumps. I can use a Motorola 6800 or you know, 6810, you know, that's all I need. I said, well, well, why do you need our platform? Well, the marketing people said I gotta have an LCD. It's gotta be color. It's gotta have Wi-Fi. It's gotta have Bluetooth and all that stuff added on top of it. So what you're seeing in my mind is the shrinking of the PC, bringing it down into embedded space, into refrigerators, into bicycles, okay? You know, why anybody would wanna hang a PC on your dead refrigerator, I don't know. Until you open it up and it says, do you really wanna eat tonight? Okay, well, <laughs> may, may, maybe not. Uh, we're finding customers that are putting these things in some of the wildest places mainly because they need connectivity, okay? And these platforms can provide that, that capability. The biggest thing is freedom, okay? Open hardware provides us the pre freedom, freedom to choose, to try things, and that's something that, that we, we desperately need, okay? We, we need to be able to innovate off of what other people have done and keep adding to that process, and we're all gonna benefit from it. We've gotta change the way things are, are done, okay? You know, it's gotten harder and harder to, to get good uh, hardware talent into this country. There's a lots of different reasons for that. You know, mainly, maybe computer science is easier to go into. Uh, you know, I don't know. But like I said, I challenge a software person to try to build a system without having hardware. And uh, besides, we need to get them on something other than Windows. Let's, let's give them something that they can really sink their teeth into. There's nothing quite like making that first LED come on and, you know, you know you're actually talking to real hardware. So what exactly is open hardware? Let's make sure it isn't this. <laughs> I will not take credit for this. This has been floating around for a number of years, but I don't see this, you know, I don't want to see any holy water. Please keep the smoke inside, okay? It's better, you know. Where's the attribution? <laughs> the what? It's a messy license, where's the attribution? I'm trying to, that's why I said, I need to find out who it was. Okay, fan, fantastic. Okay, so somebody email me, that's what I said first, I'll email the information and I'll, I'll give them attribute and if they need a royalty, uh, then I'll hire them to do another one, okay? <laughs> because some, I like to see some, you know, I see the flux capacitor there and uh, some things like that. So I had another picture that I couldn't find, which was of uh, two PCBs like this that had the resistors going through hole from top to bottom. Oh, it was just a monster, but I ran out of hard drive space and I think I deleted it. So, had a guy send this to me. So, um, thanks for uh, having me here and to talk and I don't know how much time we have left. Four minutes, okay. So I'll take four questions and I'll say I don't know after each one of them. <laughs>
Yes, sir. Yeah, but you're still locked into the TI chip. So, especially with the DSP is pretty proprietary. So, this TI can get it out of the we, we are trying, okay? The question was based upon the proprietariness of the DSP, okay? And TI is well known as the DSP company. We we're working very hard. Uh, yeah, if you see, I've lost most of my hair. Jason's a little bit younger, but he's gonna be catching up with me before too long. Jason is working hard to make that happen. But TI is the world's largest shipper of ARM processors. We ship billions of them, okay? And we've actually got a product group inside of TI that only does ARMs. There are no DSPs inside of it, okay? So we're a very large uh, ARM licensee, but yes, we need to open up the DSP. And uh, it's one of the things that like gauge I arrays. Do what? Open the gate arrays. <laughs> okay, we can do that too. Yeah, that's gonna be interesting. Open, open source silicon. I gotta kinda think about that one. Uh, like I said, we're the least one, we're the least qualified to determine who needs to use our, or how to use our parts. So yes, there are plenty of challenges and, and TI is a very large company. It's kind of like turning an aircraft carrier with oars, okay? <laughs> it's it's going to take a while, but uh, please keep feeding that back to us, uh, to Jason and I, and we want to learn from the community, as I said, and we'll take that to the highest channels of TI. And just so you know, I work in strategic marketing at TI and uh, typically we start talking about something three, three and a half years before it actually happens, okay? So we're trying to look ahead at these issues and uh, we welcome everyone's input that we can get. You, any other questions? So I, I think Beagle's fantastic. I've got one of the boards myself, that's great. Um, if you want to play around with an existing design, I think what Bruce is saying is uh, he's being a bit more Forceful in his statement, but there's a lot of you know FPGA hardware out there now, mm -hmm. uh, Xilinx, uh, Microblaze stuff, which is not open source, but there are open source OR 10K chips mm -hmm. that you know. So it may be that the future is the wire up of tomorrow is people learning to write PHDL or a log at home and designing chips that way. That might be where, where, where it is. Nothing. It's, it's the bitstream format that yes. we need. Well, uh, personally, I'm an Altera guy, so. I, I, I dealt with I dealt with Xilinx back in the day when everything had to be hand edited. Okay, you drew the little lines on there, and because if you recompiled, all of a sudden the same circuit didn't work again. So I'm an Altera guy. But yeah, I, I totally agree. I love FPGAs. I've used them a lot in my career. But uh, you know, I think one of the questions we need to ask is: Is that open hardware? Is the VHDL code? Is that a definition of open hardware, or is that a definition of software? You know, the stuff that makes the chip do that thing, what is it? I think we need to take that into consideration as well. Oh, my time's up. Thank you very much. <laughs>